Okay, friends, I am just thrilled about who I'm sitting here with today. I'm sitting here with my real life dear friend turned book editor, turned book agent, <laughs> Carly Kellerman. Carly, welcome to Girls' Night. Oh, hi. I'm it so feels, glad to be here. It feels so special to have you here. I will have to, if if we get into the depths of how much you matter to Girls' Night, we will be here for a very long time. <laughs> so instead, let me just say, I'm so, guys, I'm so, so happy for you to get to hear from Carly. She's someone who speaks into my life so regularly and with such wisdom. Um, she's also so much fun. <laughs> and um, so I'm just, I'm thrilled to get to have my friends connect again. Um, Carly, for women who don't know you yet, can you tell us who you are, what you do, and a fun fact about yourself? Well, thank you for that very lovely introduction. You're incredibly generous. And I just, it's one of the greatest delights of my life to get to work with you in so many ways and be real life friends. So yay for us. We're doing it. (laughs) Yay for us. (laughs) Uh, My name is Carly Kellerman. As Stephanie said, I am a former editor, associate publisher in the publishing world. I recently moved over to be a literary agent to work a little bit more closely with authors, help them um, curate their message and advocate for them across the board um, with editorial and publishing partners in the industry, which has just been a dream come true on so many levels. So um, that's an exciting, relatively recent development. And a fun fact um, is that I have a hot sauce problem in as much as I want all of them, in as much as I literally have like mm, at least 15 items in my refrigerator at this exact moment to make your food spicier. Oh, <laughs> oh. Okay. Okay. We have to like elaborate a little bit because it's not just hot hot sauce. No, I mean you've got there's your pepper and chilies. You've got your sambal. You've got actually. Can I tell you? Yeah. There's a little boutique in my neck of the woods called Fromage, and it's like a specialty store devoted to hot sauce and pickled goods. And in walking in there, I was like. I have unlocked a new dream now. Like if I could have a boutique specialty grocery dedicated to condiments, I could die happy. Oh my gosh. Because pickles are absolutely, pickled goods are absolutely part of the the thing for you. And then also like salt. Like salt is not one kind. I, I mean, like if you saw my salt collection, you'd be so disappointed, especially now. Like that. There's so much fine nowadays. I just, I'm really all about the condiments, I guess. I'll introduce it. Like hot sauce is a gateway, but it's all about the sauce. You know, I like an accessory in my life and on my food. And that's what I think a condiment is really meant to be. Oh my gosh. This is is what everything in the world does. Yes, this, 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 this. Mm -hmm. Um, So Carly, we are going to... um, I just... We're going to have to do a whole episode, at least one, about all things book. Um, I would love for us to talk about like, you know, my publishing journey, your publishing journey, how they've intersected. Um, For anyone who's wanting to write and publish a book, like you are the person that like makes our hands sweat. Like we're like, (laughs) oh my gosh, she like works in publishing. Okay, she's an agent. Like she's, I mean... You are you are the person that we want to we want to pick your brain a million times over about book publishing because I know that writing a book and publishing a book is a dream for so many of us. We will talk about that another day. I, um, I today am so excited to talk to you not as a professional literary queen that you are, um, but as a person who has both moved away and moved back home. Mm. Yeah. Um, this is something that is so tender for me. Like as a per, I, like I moved away from home and being away from home has so many feelings. Um, and I know that women in our community are are so many of us are in this place of thinking about is it time to make a locational change? Mm-hmm. How does my family factor into that? And then also maybe you have moved away from home. Is it time to go back? And like all of those come with a million feelings. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. I want to hear, first of all, can you tell us about the decision you made 
to leave your hometown in Michigan to move to Nashville? Like, tell us the story about how that came about. I'm going to attempt to make this a Cliff Notes version, but the basis that we need to understand about this move on my part is I have always, my entire life, felt um, a very sharp duality between loving home in every in every meaning of the word. I love my corner of Michigan. I love being involved with my family. I've often joked that my big fat Greek wedding, the movie feels a little autobiographical <laughs> um, because I've got like, I mean, I graduated with what, five cousins in my literal class at my literal high school. It, it like, it's enmeshed, it's big, it's loud, it's mostly fun, a little sticky sometimes, but mostly great. Um, I love home, but I have also always felt an equally strong pull of wanderlust and adventure and imagining myself as a big city gal and and what have you. And so those things always felt um, a little bit in opposition to each other, which I was able to kind of navigate for a while by leaving my actual hometown and living in Grand Rapids, which is an hour away. Um, and I, I love that I love that city. It's a great, great city. But um, around, I don't know, 25 or 26, um, things had just started taking a turn. I was starting to feel like like everything was kind of stalling out, right? I was not seeing anyone that kept me there. All of my friends were getting married, starting to have babies. I kind of felt a little bit behind in that regard. I had an entry-level position at a company that I was really thrilled to be a part of, but I didn't see a clear path forward there um, in the Grand Rapids office specifically. Um, And I, yeah, I was starting to feel like a secondary character in my own life. Like I existed to support the narratives around me um, instead of having agency um, to do it myself. And so there were some really interesting conversations coming out of the Nashville area. It seemed like every author I was looking at or reading or all, all these things just started coalescing around Nashville. And in a not so ironic twist, um, my company also had a location in that office. So I kind of uh, bootstrapped my way down. I drove my parents' car. I slept on your couch. I just <laughs> camped out with my laptop in the Nashville office and... Uh, strong-armed a couple of conversations and um, ended up getting a job offer to work out of that office and moving. What did you, what were some of the things that, I mean, you said stalling out, but I want to hear just, I want to hear you touch on that a little bit more. What were some of the things that were like, I need a change or like some of the things that we can look for in our own lives that might be pointing to like, Not like I need to, I don't know, work on my self-care regimen, but more like I need to pack some boxes and borrow a car and drive move to a different place. I would say a theme of how I think about these kind of life choices, whether it's moving or any major transition really, is it comes down to the self-awareness and the bravery to be really honest. Um... I knew that if I stayed in Michigan, I was really afraid that I would always wonder what would have happened if it, what would have happened if I had left. Mm-hmm. Um, I had seen some friends make big moves, cross country moves by themselves, and I saw so much growth coming out of that for them. And I thought, you know, I, I was a relatively healthy individual. I was pursuing things outside of my comfort zone in the context of being close to home. Um, you know, I'd gone away to college not knowing anybody. I'd traveled the world after I graduated college and was way outside of my comfort zone for a while. And all of these things, I was taking all of these steps to be a healthy, actualized adult. Um, but I just felt like there was a piece of the puzzle missing. And based on what I was seeing around me from friends who'd made the moves and from that fear that I was going to miss having the having taken the opportunity, um, I just knew it was something I had to do. What reservations did you have about it? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> Several. I mean, um, so at that, in that era, I always knew I was going to be an aunt before I was going to be a mom. Just looking at my family, I was like, that is 
likely going to be the order of events. And so right when I was kind of like starting to weigh the pros and cons very heavily of moving away, my sister said she was pregnant with my first nephew. And that was like, well, I I mean, I I, I guess I stay forever. And it was, again, that duality of like, the inclination to stay had never felt stronger. There'd never been a bigger reason. But there was also, that was proof positive of the fact that if I stay, I'm orienting my entire life around other people and not in the and not in the selfless good way. Do you know what I'm saying? It felt like I've never wanted to stay more because of that baby, but I never knew I needed to leave more clearly because of that as well. Um, so that family draw was a big thing. Um, finances. I mean, Michigan is wildly affordable. And while Nashville, especially back then, seemed like, you know, it wasn't like moving to New York or LA. It was a big, big step up in cost of living. And I was entry-level publishing. I'm not making money. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, I'm driving this, you know, just beater of a car that broke down every other week. I mean, I was not in the best financial shape at that move. And I was really freaked out. I was going to do irreparable damage and like never be able to get ahead, you know? Um, And there were people um, that I was very fond of and cared for very much in Grand Rapids. One person in particular who I was like, what if I'm throwing something away here? But ultimately, I I just knew that I had to make that move. And I'm, spoiler alert, wildly glad that I did. Did you um did you have like a timeline or like a time limit? Did you say like mm. I'm gonna move to Nashville for a year or like or were you thinking I'm going to move forever? And the reason I, the reason I'm asking is when I moved away from Colorado, I moved away thinking that I would be gone for like six months. <laughs> like yeah. that's I took a, a position that was supposed to be temporary or, or they said that I could work remotely. This was like way before remote working was a thing, but um, they said I could work remotely after about six months. But then I moved there and I met Carl and like, I still don't live in Colorado. And that's <laughs> been, it's been years now. Um, but so I really thought like, I think if you would have said, Hey, are you moving away forever? Like, I don't know that I would have been able to go. Did yeah. you have kind of a time frame? Um, I don't remember putting like an actual number on it, but I I left knowing very, very clearly that the same highway that got me there was going to get me back one day. And I I always knew I would move home. That was a non-negotiable to me. But I, but I knew I needed to go at the same time. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's the, the truth that you can make a decision for a season and it doesn't have to be forever is so helpful. Like yeah. it just, I don't know, making any sort of decision forever is so intimidating, like, well, and also unrealistic. Really like, know. we don't know what forever holds. No. And there were definitely times, I mean, there was, this, there was definitely a stretch um, during those years that I was in Nashville that I thought, what if, what if, what if I didn't go back? Like, what if this was where we landed or um, somewhere else? You know, one of, one of the big inciting incidents um, that made me brave enough to go in the first place was, um, your wedding weekend. You've heard me tell the story a hundred times, but um, I was in Georgia for your wedding and it was the, we were just all kind of hanging out in the pool before the rehearsal dinner and getting ready. And I just remember looking around and it was this like hazy, hot, sunny day. And, you know, your bridal party was so fun. Of course it was. And I just looked around that pool and thought, I have so many best friends I've never met yet. And and that was an incredible feeling, right? And and in the same way, that's that's kind of a that's a touchstone that I come back to often in my life of I don't know what the future holds, right? It's to say I'm making this decision and it's gonna be this way forever feels um short-sighted at best and maybe narrow-minded at more. Um and so there were certainly moments after moving where I thought maybe we do stay or maybe we go somewhere different entirely. What would I be okay if we never ended up back in Michigan? Um, and it was really important to kind of weigh that out and go back on purpose instead of just because that's what I had always said I was going to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to make the decision like fresh yeah. all over again as your current self, exactly. not just fulfilling what you're, you know, however many years 
higher self had decided to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. What happened when you moved to Nashville? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, let's meet anyone fun. <laughs> you can meet. Um, yeah, I accidentally met the man I was going to marry about 10 minutes after moving, which was a delightful surprise after just feeling like I was trying to get water out of a rock up in Michigan. Suddenly I was like, <laughs> hello, Jesse. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's the most classic and cliche and unhelpful story in the world of like, I finally relaxed and wasn't in a hurry. And then, and then I met the man of my dreams. And um, so, yeah, I met my husband, Jesse, and we met very quickly and fell in love very quickly. And it was a super fun whirlwind situation. Um, I made incredible friends at the office in Nashville, some of my best friends to this day. I had opportunities um, professionally that would have been incredibly hard to come by, I imagine, if I'd stayed home. Um, and just really set into motion this chain of events that has led to a really fulfilling and exciting career. Ups and downs, 100%. I'm painting with a very wide brush right now. Mm -hmm. Um, But by and large, I would not be here where I am today. Um, Career-wise, relationship-wise. Two babies-wise. If I hadn't moved. Yeah, yeah. To be clear, I think I'd be okay. (laughs) <laughs> but, yeah. but, but I wouldn't be here. And I'm, I'm so glad for these specifics. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, one thing that I want to mention is that like, it, I feel like it's selling your, this is what happens when someone who knows your story is interviewing you. <laughs> They're like what you didn't say. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, da- it's dangerous. The power I have. Um, Yikes. You did. I feel like you did meet Jesse like fairly quickly, but, and you did relax. Like you were less um, like white knuckled on trying to figure out your future, trying to make it happen right away. And I think that that's really helpful. But part of what you, like, it wasn't like you were passive because when you moved to Nashville, you immediately put yourself out there in a really brave, really fun, like uh, really like almost lighthearted, like I want to use the word silly, but it wasn't silly. It was just like fun. Wait, can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Um, I was so thrilled to have a fresh start because, and this is a bigger conversation for perhaps a different context. um, I felt very much like my hometown I often joke that if the South is the Bible Belt, Southwest Michigan's kind of the coordinating tie clip a little farther north. Um, And so all of my friends, my community in Michigan, it's just, there's this cultural norm of getting married very young. By 24, I had no single friends, literally not one single friend at 24 in my area. And I mean, I guess some people were still dating or like seriously dating or about to get engaged, but I just, I felt so behind. I felt so much pressure. Um, A lot of my girlfriends were having babies very young. People were buying houses. It just felt like, what happened? (laughs) Like, I thought we were in this together and I'm suddenly in a totally different season of life. And so when I moved to Nashville, it was, it was the first time I'd been around people my age who you know, some of them were married, sure, or seriously dating, but like they were single people and other people understood what it was to be dating in that moment. And people were building careers in ways that I wasn't experiencing up north. And so it just breathed new life and energy and excitement into um, how I went about my days. And um, I moved with the luxury of a couple of built-in friends, you being one of them. Um, and happened onto a team that had some really exciting, fun people that I got to be very close with. I also just kind of put out like a cattle call. (laughs) And I was like, does anybody know anybody in Nashville? And through that, like a former college roommate had a friend. She's like, you should meet her. And then I had dinner with that girl. And then I just was like, I'm gonna just have a cookout one night. And my roommate, it was just like this like huge, like, just like fun little mixer vibe, you know? And it was just the friends of friends. It was it was the power of weak ties, which we talk about from Dr. Meg Jay's book, The Defining Decade All the Time. Um, and and it, 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 was, it was incredible. It was so much fun. It was so much fun. 
you, um, another thing that you did in that in kind of like, I don't know, like, I feel like you cast a wide net when you got here. And there is something to, to being said, or there's something to be said about like, a really a fresh start and like not having all of your for either your home or forever people like watch you exist. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it's you you have some space from the people who you've whose opinions you've always held the closest and you're able to like flex some new muscles. You like you're able to try being like the funny person without someone being like, "Well, you're not funny." Like you've yeah. never been funny. <laughs> or the but- like <laughs> not you, obviously. You've always been funny. Um, but like you're able to be the outgoing one or you're able to try new style or you're able to like, yeah. I go by Steph now, not Stephanie yeah. or you yeah. know, something like that. It's just without like your, you know, best friend from preschool and your mom being like, what are you, what are you trying to be? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? It was um, a really wild moment. The first weekend I woke up in my new, in the house that I was living in with girls and and just being like, nobody here needs anything from me. And again, it's it's important and beautiful to be enmeshed in this life and to have people to whom you're responsible and who care for you in return, you know? But I had just gotten to a pretty unhealthy... It felt a little bit like I was a one-sided codependent relationship up at home, you know, where I needed to be needed to feel like I mattered. And so when I left... And that was no longer, it wasn't the same. Um, I got to really figure out who I actually wanted to be and practice that instead. Um, and I don't think, I don't think there was any big like 180 shift. I don't think I was a totally different person, but I just think that my posture got a lot healthier. And, um, you know, I was able to kind of relax and not be so like you said, white knuckled on controlling the outcome of every single day. Can you tell us uh, about your dating marathon? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The reason I have a reason for asking. um, And the the reason is, I think it is really um, common for people to hear things like, you know, I just like, it just kind of happened when I, you know, showed up or whatever, but you intentionally like cast your net and you did so in a way that was like fun and again, lighthearted, lighthearted, but you like really upped your numbers. Like you you upped your odds of meeting someone great. I and you were doing that when you met Jesse. Helped. Yeah. You what? I said, I moved to a bigger city, which certainly helped with the yeah. numbers game. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't mean to make this passive. Oh, we bumped into each other in the grocery and it was love at first sight. It wasn't, it wasn't that. It was, um, I suddenly had a lot more free time <laughs> than I had up in Michigan. And, you know, like most of us do at different points, you're like, I'm just going to like take a break from the dating seat. I'm just going to like give myself some time to not think about that. And then I was on a walk with one of my new roommates. We were like, we'd known each other, I don't know, three weeks maybe. And we were just kind of getting, just chatting. And she mentioned the dating app Hinge, which was a new one to me. And I'm like, you know what? Actually, that sounds fun. And I I think that if I can do this and not make it feel like as big of a deal as it did at home, when, like I said, all of my friends were married, it just felt like I was in a fishbowl and I needed to, I needed to win the prize. I needed to get married <laughs> and wrap that up so that I could be taken seriously or like look like an adult to people. And again, in retrospect, I think I put a lot of that pressure on myself, but that didn't make it feel less suffocating in the moment, you know? Yeah. So I downloaded the app and was just pretty... I mean, you know, I had standards, of course, and I was... Um, I would like to think mostly pretty smart about my choices, but it was just one of those things where I'm like, listen what do we have to lose here? Like if we matched and we chatted and you don't seem like an actual danger, then let's just meet up in a public place. Anyway, that's a different conversation, but what's the story? It's 17 dates in 17 days. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's so awesome. And it's... I like to think of it in retrospect as I was dating Nashville. Like it was not the individuals as much as it was like, 
I was falling in love with this city against the backdrop of these like very silly dates. And I just adopted the mantra, the mantra, the worse the date, the better the story. And I have several. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but somewhere in the middle, uh, this guy, Jesse, DM'd me about my profile picture with a tiger. And he said, I'm going to steal that tiger. And I said, he's in Thailand, so good luck. And then he stood me up on our first date, which was a miscommunication. And now we're married with two babies. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I really love it because I mean, one, you had, when I first moved to Nashville and I was making this a new home, I moved with my new husband, which sounds better or sounds like less lonely. It it probably was and also wasn't in some ways because um, we were like not in a fun moment when we moved here. We had no money. We had just lost our jobs. We like were in such transition. I remember for years and maybe even still when I would have the opportunity to go to like a great restaurant, I would ask you for a recommendation because you'd been on like fun dates around town. (laughs) Carl and I had been like eating our Chipotle leftovers on the second day, you know. And it was more than just boy dates though. It was more than just like guys I was matching with online. It was like meeting new girlfriends and my new work friends taking me to like dive places for hot dogs on lunches. We had Friendship Friday lunches and they were so fun. It was just, it was such a special season of life, you know? I mean, I think about how people reminisce back on high school or college as this very finite amount of time um, that changed everything. And in a very real way, you know, I went to high school, I went to college, I have experiences like that, that I look back on, but Nashville was like the toddlerhood of my adulthood in the best way possible. I love that. I think the other reason I love the seven, the 17 and 17 is that, um, I am, I don't know, probably right on the line between introvert and extrovert. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it is, I can make new friends. I would say I'm good at making new friends. Yeah. I totally am intimidated by it though, just like everybody else. And I'm the kind of person where like, if I can give myself a gold star or like check a box or like complete a challenge, I am so much more likely to do something. And so if if I were to move someplace random again, or when I move someplace random again, um, I don't know what we will have talked about by this when this comes out, but when I w- next next time if that happens, I find myself someplace new. I really am going to make like a challenge for myself yeah. where I'm like, I'm going to have three coffee dates every single week, yeah. just until I find my people. Because just having those baby steps that I can, I don't, I'm not responsible for the outcome, but I am responsible for what I put in, yeah. and knowing that if I put this in long enough. I will get to an outcome that I'm happy with. And the same is true of dating. Like, I mean, unless you're really, really barking up the wrong tree, the more you do it, the more people you meet, the more likely you are to meet someone who ends up being great. Exact yeah. same way as friendship. So um, I just have always been really inspired by that. And I also think when it comes to dating, we one of the mistakes that we make that I see women make so often is feeling like you have to have some sort of magical connection with someone online before you meet them in person. No, that's and the all worst. you can't. Yeah. All of the the data that I've seen, all of the um, research, all of the, you know, anecdotal evidence says the sooner you meet in person, the better, because then you don't spend a month texting with someone who you never are going to have something with. Like there's just information you can only find when you meet them in person. Well, and further... And at the same time, you get to know a great city. That's exactly... Yeah. Okay. Um, You're also just like making that person up. You're filling in the gaps in a way that is, you know, a little bit of a rom-com. And when you're with them and getting to know them in real life, like they get to inform that in a more meaningful way, you know? And um, Jesse is... He, he felt like a cheat code, honestly, in a very meaningful way to how great the experience was. Not only because, you know, you're falling in love, like that's never going to be a bad time, hopefully. But also he'd been here for a few years. He's from Oregon originally. And he'd been pretty established in a friend group. And like, I think... Um, so we went on two dates and then he went back to Oregon for like three and a half weeks for work. And I just thought, well, that was fun for those two dates, but I don't think I'm ever going to see that guy again. And he just like hit all the right notes as far as like calling and FaceTiming. And like, we were just, we were in touch and it was really lovely. And I, 
picked him up from the airport when he got home to Nashville and I never went on another first date ever again. And um, our first time going out after he was back in Tennessee was on a pontoon day. One of his, uh, he was friends, he is, we are friends with um, this woman who is so fun. I mean, she is a magnet. She like literally, the way Jesse met this woman is one of his friends was sitting next to her on a plane on their way home from California. And all of a sudden like, we're like, we're real life friends. Like I stay in her house when we come back and visit Tennessee. And so that was, she had organized this big pontoon day with all of these people. It was bananas. It was so fun. And like literally on that pontoon, I met a girl I ended up living with a couple of months later and people who were at our wedding. And it's just, like I said, Jesse was a cheat code because he had some stuff established too, but it was, it was amazing. I feel like I learned so much about myself With that move, I experienced things I just never would have if I hadn't have left. And it was the best, it was the absolute best decision I could have made um, in that season. What do we do if the people in our life don't support our move? Like a way, whether it's to a new city, whether it's to just a new house, whether it's to like a different country, like wh- what yeah. do we do if we're saying, hey, I think I need this and our families or our closest people are like, I don't think you should do that. That's really hard. That's really challenging. And I was, I mean, candidly, I was very fortunate to have a lot of support. I think the people who knew me best and loved me most saw that I was kind of floundering um, at home and the opportunity was really really positive. And so I had a lot of support and encouragement. Um, And I never had to feel bad or ashamed or embarrassed if I was like struggling on a day being away, like I could be so honest about it, you know? Um, I don't want to skip ahead in the narrative, but when I was, when we were talking about moving back, I felt a lot of that kind of internalized shame and fear though, about what it would look like and what people would think about me moving back to Michigan. Um, And I think in that case, you seriously, seriously have to weigh who is saying what, you know? Like, again, it comes back to that self-awareness and that honesty with yourself about what is the most important thing to you? What, What matters the most in your life? And, And does, you know, a former frenemy get a vote? in your ultimate happiness like why is she getting that level of weight in your in your mental load here do you know what i'm saying so when i was thinking about when Jesse and i were talking about what it looked like to move back home down the road years later um i thought about a former boss and what she'd said to me about my potential and i thought what if she thinks i'm throwing it away by going back to a place where there are fewer obvious opportunities Or this girl who I had been friends with back in the day and she thought very little of our hometown, you know? Was she going to think I was unimpressive or worse, small-minded and closed-minded for going back to a small town? And then I'm like, when is the last time I spoke to that person? Why do I think she's watching me? Why do I think she would care? And that didn't necessarily like take a little bit of it, t- it took it took the edge off of it. Let's put it that way. Um, if I spent too much time thinking about it, I still felt a little panic that she'd think I'm dumb. But then again, I could come right back to, and that matters to me because, like, <laughs> why why should that matter? So I think that was how I dealt with perception of how people saw it. But if people are actually talking to you and saying, "I don't think this is the right move for you." I think you need to be very honest about who they are and what their role is in your life. Are they somebody that you trust to have your best instincts and interests in mind? Um, and, And know that you ultimately get to be the decider. Like you get to choose. And it's important that you make the choice for yourself on purpose. Yeah. This is something, oh man, I this is like... I'm so new talking about this that it like makes me nervous every time I say something about it. But that's something we talk about so much in in my book is is that you know people um are are going everyone so many people are going to have an opinion about what you do yeah Uh, and that's really really hard. 
I'm a, I'm a people pleaser. I'm a rule follower. Like it is really hard for me when anybody disagrees with the decisions that I'm making. But ultimately, you are the one who has to live with the consequences of them. And so if you, and then also like ultimately, you're the only one going like, the the person who is speaking in your life, you know, it's, it's hard when it's like a parent. Yeah. Your parents do, should have your best interest at heart, but your parents aren't also in the same spot as you are. They've already built their lives in a lot of ways and they built them on purpose or maybe they didn't, but they they have, they had a life that they got to build. Yeah. This one is yours and they may have thoughts, they may have opinions, but they may see the world differently than you do. They may want different things for you than you want for yourself. And so they may say like, you should take steps A, B, C, because I want you to get to Z. And you may be like, okay, but I actually want to go to 20. So <laughs> I feel like I should go like one, two, three. And yeah. both of you, both of your ideas can be good, but ultimately like you're the only one who has to either spend your life at Z or at 20. Yeah. And and they they don't, frankly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when we ended up back in Michigan, um, we decided instead of living in my hometown, we wanted to buy a house in Grand Rapids. It felt like a softer landing place um, coming from a city like Nashville to go to a city to Grand Rapids because it's got great things going on. It's fun. There's a great community. Um, a lot of my friends from college were still there. There was a church that I loved up there. It felt like this is more us. This is right for us. And I will say that in that context, my parents were like, what do you, why would you do that? Why would you move home only to move an hour away from home? Because do you have to understand like we, it's like Sunday night dinner kind of vibes, you know, like it's a random Thursday and we all end up at my sister's house to watch a football game or something. Like it, it's that kind of daily activity and if you're an hour away from that, you're not going to be a part of it, you know? And it came from such a good place. And I always knew that about my parents, that they wanted us, if we're going to be here, they wanted us here. Um, but it really mattered to me that we were going to end up in Grand Rapids. Spoiler alert, from a strategic <laughs> and, a, and a family standpoint, we ultimately decided that why would we move that far away, <laughs> that far away? We came from 500 miles away and then like 50 was too many, but it was. Um, so we did end up buying a house in Kalamazoo and it ended up being the best, again, the best decision ever. But to my family's credit, nobody was like actually pressuring us or saying like, you can't do that. It was just kind of navigating it. And honestly, I feel like that kind of opposition gave us what we needed to make the best decision for us. Yeah, yeah. Um, how, so how did the conversation of like, it might be time to go home start? Um, it started about <laughs> eight weeks after Jesse and I started dating. <laughs> it's, it's so silly. And I mean, I don't know. Um, so Jesse and I started dating at the end of May and then he was back from his work trip in Oregon at the end of June and probably the first weekend of August that year. Um, on a Wednesday, I was like, hey, do you want to go to the beach this weekend? And he's like, okay. Um, there is no beach in Tennessee. I'm talking about Michigan on Lake Michigan. And I was like, um, the beach in Michigan. And he goes, right. And I go, to meet my family. And he's like, I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay. I'm like, yes, I, I was there before you. Exactly. I, got, I already got there. Yeah. I thanks. just needed to make it really clear. And yeah. so again, this brand new, he's just the most wonderful man in the world. I dragged him up to the beach. My family was all in love with him. It was really fun. And so we're on the shore of Lake Michigan and it's this romantic moment. And I look up at him and I say, hey, babe. And he's like, yeah. And I go, I, I, I have to move back here one day. <laughs> like, this is where I end up. And similar to how we got up there in the first place, he goes, I know, we will. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'm just making sure. Because if that's going to be a problem, then... This then is going to be a problem. Work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it was always a known quantity. You know, we have a really um, warm involved, helpful family here that 
we're very close with. Um, again, from a strategic standpoint, the cost of living allowed us to adapt our lifestyle to homeownership and children and still like have some financial flexibility that mattered a lot to us. Um, we have a lot of support here. And so it was just one of those things where it made a lot of sense. We always knew we wanted to come back. Um, and as far as the when, we got to the point in Nashville where it was like, what is what is the line? Fisher cut bait? You know, it's like we either need to buy a house and put down roots here or go to where we want to put down the roots because it was like we were ready to start talking about babies. We wanted to move out of our apartment and get a house. And we knew that buying a house there would like keep us there for longer, which meant either postponing kids or having kids away from family. And that felt super intimidating to me. So it was just kind of, it was just kind of a logistical and strategic conversation. And um, Jesse got a job offer one day um, that was going to allow him to work re- permanently remotely. Um, again, this was 2019. So pre yeah. most of us working remotely in some context. Yeah. Um, and that was the moment. So once we had that last piece lined up, and my job was such that I could take it back to Grand Rapids with me. Um, and so that was never the major concern. So we had kind of been laying some groundwork. You know, I took a role within my company specifically that could be in either location. Mm-hmm. Um, we would pursued this position that Jesse got, knowing that it would allow him the flexibility to be remote. And once he accepted that job, we called my parents and we're like, after our lease is up, I think we're heading, we're heading north. Oh my gosh. Um, what would you say, you know, I know that again, so many women are, are in the middle somewhere. I mean, I am like, I moved away from home kind of by, kind of by accident, have stayed away from home on purpose in the fact that like Nashville's been a really good place for us and it's it's been the best place for us and like you know for the the time that we've been here um but i think that that's always kind of a a question in my mind in everyone's mind that isn't it is like is it time to is it time to go back is can i go back should i go back did you i know that you had a lot of hangups when it came to like opportunities or like the things that you were giving up about Nashville, you weren't, were, you were going to like waste your potential by being, you know, according to that boss's, the thoughts that you were putting in her head. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Like, were any of those things true? Did any of the things you were worried about happen? Um, No, not by a long shot. I will say that the second call we made after we were like, okay, this is the year we're moving home at the end of our lease. We called our parents, my parents to say, to ask if we could stay with them for a minute. So we didn't have to try to like rush into buying a house that we weren't sure about. And my second call was to a therapist. (laughs) I'm like, I, I felt like I left home running from something. Um, This sense that I wasn't enough, that I couldn't, meet expectations that I had on myself that I felt like were being put on me. Um, Can I be in a healthy, uh, close proximity relationship with this family that I love so much that I'm so close with and still prioritize the family that I'm building with my husband? Can can both of these things be in a 20-mile radius of each other? Mm -hmm. And so um, that was... That was a big concern for me moving home. Um, Like I said earlier, is moving to a small place make me a small person? That was really scary to me to think about. Um, And then again, the opportunity cost of my career, it felt very much like I was resigning myself to scraps in some ways, which again is just like so dramatic. (laughs) But it felt very, very real. Um, And... um, I think I had to work through those things before I could move home or at least start the conversation and and build some awareness around that. Um, And so 
the answer to did any of those things come true is like, no, if anything, there were unbelievable opportunities that I never could have foreseen or strategized my way into because that's how life works. You you make the decisions with the cards that you have in your hand and an eye towards the future, but you don't you don't know what you pick up next, you know? Like I don't the the shift, the industry shifts that the pandemic brought, the personnel shifts it, that happened in my company accordingly, um, it just opened things up, changed things around. And so, you know, if you would have told me I'd be sitting in my current seat as a as a literary agent when I moved away from Nashville, I'd be like, how? <laughs> what? And the twists and turns that got us here were completely unforeseen. Um, and thrilling. And I just, you know, now in a very real way, I don't know that I would have been in this position if I hadn't have left Nashville. (laughs) You know, you've got to take the steps in front of you and do it with boldness and hope and strategy and faith. Like those are the things, right? Some of those things you can control. Some of those things you can only put out there. Um, But at this point in this moment, I'm very, very grateful for those moves. I love that. I love that so much. Um, do you have any just like last, I don't know, any anything that you're like, okay, she needs to hear this for the woman who's thinking about starting an adventure someplace else or for the woman who's like, I think it might be time to go back and be home. It feels super flip to be like, what's the worst that could happen, you know? But what I said at the beginning of this, like I knew that the same highway that took me to Nashville was going to take me home, right? And so I think that's more true than a lot of us realize. Like the same tenacity and ingenuity and boldness that's kind of fueling your dream and your hope to try something new. If you get there and it's not right, I believe that you're going to know. And I believe that that same boldness and tenacity will give you what you need to make another decision, right? Similar to how we were talking, like I didn't put a time frame on that era specifically um, because making trying to make a decide once decision in this kind of life context it's not always going to work. It's not always going to serve you best. And so I don't know. I think that I think that know what you want in a macro sense, but be willing to be flexible on how you get there. Um, and as far as moving home, I mean, if you want to move back home, there's something to be there for, I would guess. Like if you don't want to move back home, there you go, you know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but if you do... And there's an opportunity, give it a shot. It's 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 spectacular in my context and complicated in its own way, of course. Um, but I just I couldn't be happier um, to have left and to be back. I love that. Um, the mental picture I got when you said uh, you, the tenacity to make a new decision or to like change it the way you need to. Um, I think when we're talking about like big life decisions or, you know, the journey of life, we talk about like, you know, a salt, like a strong left turn or hard left turn or hard right turn or things like that. But I just got this mental picture of like, when you're trying to parallel park (laughs) and like, it's not going well, or like you find yourself like kind of stuck and you end up doing like a 47 point turn, just like a little bit, a little bit back, a little bit, a little bit back. Like, and uh, you're hoping that no one is watching you because it's so embarrassing. And the more people are watching you, the longer it takes. It's a whole thing. But like... Sometimes I feel like we do know and we are able to make decisive left turns or right turns. But a lot of times I feel like we're just making really small adjustments to kind of wiggle ourselves into a spot. And both of those things are available to you, both leading up to a decision or or a transition like this. And also once you get there. Yeah, that's right. And I think that trying to plan ahead your next 15 steps... um, Like, listen, I literally have three different notebooks on my desk right now. I could hold them up and show you. And they have different plans and goals and 
affirmations and like all of these things for this year and the next 10. <laughs> Lit- literally, like I gotta just... Yeah, yeah, this is so tall. This is the benefit of YouTube. Hello. I have written out... In like, I literally have written out these dates of like every major <laughs> birthday and anniversary in my family until my husband and I turned 65 to be able to think ahead and be like, okay, but if we wanted to do a graduation trip when our oldest leaves high school, but that coincides with our 20th wedding anniversary, how would we, and like, what am I doing? Like get a hobby. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so when I say, don't feel the pressure to plan 15 steps ahead, like tr- <laughs> girl, I do. I try. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> but to try to hold yourself to that, like like have the fun, dream big, set a stage. Um but also you can only make the decision in front of you <laughs> as it turns out. And to try to hold on to all of those things and um and and not be flexible and say I'm going to try this. And if it doesn't work, that doesn't make me a failure. Yeah. It just means I'm trying something different next. Yeah. It's really yeah. freeing and it's really exciting. And I think that has informed, I know that has informed so much of the best parts of my life. You know, we talked about that with dating. It's like, you can go on a first date and if it doesn't work out, fine, go on another first date right? You would do that with your career. You get in a position and there are good parts and there are challenging parts. And then there's a new opportunity. And maybe it's like a little bit of a shift to the left or to the right, but like that's going to position you for the next thing, for the next thing, for the next thing. That's how we build a life that's exciting and right for us. And I'm, I'm just so grateful to have had the flexibility and the opportunities um, in front of me and or that I just made up <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> I so. love it. I feel like it's like writing in pencil. Like, yeah, writing in pencil. It's good. You can erase it. You can fix it. Yeah. You can change it. Um, Carly, I love you. I'm your biggest fan. I'll fight your husband for that for that uh, <laughs> title any day. Um, I just, you are amazing. You are so wise, and I just, I'm better because of you. So I'm so honored to get to to take an hour of your time and share you with my friends because I know that their lives are going to be better too. Likewise, babe. This is my favorite thing. My favorite thing to tell people about Stephanie Mae Wilson is she is exactly who you think she is. Like who you see is the real freaking deal. And it is just a gift to be your friend in real life and also have these fun conversations as if we didn't talk 10 minutes ago. (laughs) (laughs) My heart just got all warm. I love you, Carr. Thank you. Thank you.